This is the story of Donald Dodd McNeil, um, as recorded by Franz Hector McNeil. So Donald Dodd was a native of Barra, Scotland. He was in the army and he took part in the siege of Lewisburg in the year 1758. Um, after the taking of Lewisburg, Donald Dog had occasion to sail through the Bedore Lakes, and he uh, was greatly pleased with the surroundings, particularly the north side of the lake now called Iona. Uh, later on that same year, Donald Dog was aboard a British man of war, which was on its way from Lewisburg to Spanish River, which is now Sydney Harbour, um, and they sighted, sighted a vessel. Uh, the vessel had old raggedy sails, and that was likely to, uh, so that it wouldn't attract the uh, attention of British vessels, which might be searching um, for uh, French vessels. Consequently, no attention was paid to it until a cook aboard the English vessel made a remark which Donald Ogg overheard. Though your appearance is ragged and dirty, yet valuable is your cargo. The cook's remark drew the attention of Donald Dog, so he made note of it, and he informed his commander of the incident at the first opportunity. At once, the British vessel was turned around and went in search of the little French ragged vessel, which they sighted as they were rounding lands in England. But fortunately for the little vessel, she was too near France to be attacked by the British. Now, it appears that it was too late in the fall for this man of war to return to Canada. Therefore, they tied up in an English port for the winter. And Donald Dog and other members of the crew got leave um, to visit their respective homes. Donald went to visit his home in Barra. He repeatedly mentioned to his folks and the Barra people how the surroundings of the Vidora Lake in Cape Breton pleased him, and also advised them that if they should ever emigrate to Cape Breton to settle, if possible, they should settle on the north side of the lake, which had the advantage over the south side, such as more shelter from the north wind, the harvest would ripen better and earlier, and good fishing grounds. Donald Dog and his comrades came back to Canada in the spring of 1759 to join General Wolfe's army in the St. Lawrence River. Donald Dog was now under Captain Donald MacDonald, Donald Gorham, who fooled the French sentry on the night of September the 12th, 1759, and where the English landed their four-ton heavy guns in the dead of night, six of them in number. Those guns are still well preserved on the Plains of Abraham, maintained by the Canadian government. At the close of the conflict, the British commander called for two volunteers to hoist the British flag, to which Donald Dog and his com uh, comrade responded. And immediately after hoisting the flag, Donald Dog was treacherously shot and killed by a bullet from a French sniper, who happened to be hiding behind the trunk of a tree. But Donald's comrade laid low the sniper in very quick order with the shot of his gun. It was nearly 40 years after this, in 1799, that the first immigrants from Barra, Scotland, came to Iona. Guided by the advice of Donald Dog, these first McNeil immigrants were as follows. Donald McNeil and his son Rory, Jonathan McNeil and his son John. A coincidence here is that the first name Donald McNeil, who settled at Iona, was the great-grandfather of Franz Hector McNeil, who is the author of this story. The story is probably attributed to that family, but uh, we know from land petitions that uh, Donald Dog's sons were born in the 1770s. Um, so it's impossible for him to have been shot um, on the Plains of Abraham. And um, they actually came um, in the, uh, probably in 1817, um, and they, um, are recorded in the Barra Parish Registry. So we know that they were um, still there um, in the uh, early 17, early 1800s. Well, they're from the island of Sandre, um, and I know that because in the um, early 1800s, his children are living on Sandre. Uh, we know that from the Barra Parish Registry. Um, and Franz Hector McNeil, who told this story, who recorded this story, uh, his great-grandfather and grandfather, who were two of the first four McNeils to come uh, to Iona uh, from Barra, were actually from Sandre. So that story was probably passed to them on the Isle of Sandre, um, and it had circulated for a number of years before they came to North America. So the story gets embellished over time. 
he was uh, likely uh, forced into it by the press gangs. So Donald Gorham McDonald, that is mentioned in Franz Hector's story, was actually um, one of the military people who um, forced the Highlanders into the uh, into the army. Okay, there was about 60 men from the Isle of Barra who were in uh, Fraser's um, regiment, um, and they spent some time in Halifax. Yeah, they assembled in 1757 while they were preparing to attack Lewisburg. Uh, well, Donald Dog um, and the Donald who settled um, at Iona, who's Franz Hector's um, ancestor, are two different people. Yeah. So there's lots of Donalds. Um, and uh, so Donald Dog never came and settled. He, he probably died in Vera. Yeah. But his sons came. Three of his sons came. And uh, two of them settled at Iona, and one of them settled over on the Christmas Island side, I believe. One of them actually died on the voyage coming over from uh, Scotland. He died on the ship. And uh, Murdoch, uh, Donald Og's son Murdoch, died coming over. And uh, he, there was another man on the ship named Alistair Moore. Um, and uh, when uh, Murdoch was dying, he uh, asked um, Alistair Moore to take care of his children and his widow, um, uh, should he not make it across. And he did die. And Alistair Moore actually did uh, take care of um, Murdoch's widow and their children. So the way it worked um, was um, they came over, um, it was basically chain migration. So the, the, the disbanded soldiers got land grants on the mainland of Nova Scotia. And then uh, when the mass emigration started from Barra, um, they came generally to Picto. Then they went to Erisag, where soldiers had settled who were of Barra descent previously. Then they went down looking for the place that Donald Og had described in the Bedora Lakes, which was the uh, which was the Iona area. And then um, those original settlers uh, came down around 1800. They cleared some land. Then they went back up to Antigonish, Erisag area. And then the following summer, or maybe a year or two later, they moved permanently down to Iona. And then fall. Uh, Following that, groups of Barra people who came over settled in that same area. So what you're getting is a transplanting of a Barra community in Cape Breton. Um, so they uh, settled according to the dialect of Gaelic they spoke and religion. So the Barra people were Catholic. And people from South East were also Catholic and had similar dialect. So they actually settled together. Um, so you get a replication of um, Barra society in Cape Breton. Well, the tradition survived. Um, Cape Breton would have been sort of on the edge of the Gaelic world. And um, uh, the Hebrides, they also uh, resisted a lot of, um, a lot of uh, influence of the English. Um, they stayed Catholic. They resisted Protestant religion. Uh, they kept their uh, Gaelic um, as well. They were more isolated. And when they came over to Cape Breton again, it was isolated and was on the edge of the Gaelic world, so to speak. So um, for a number of generations, they continued to speak Gaelic uh, in Cape Breton. And the tr they also brought their traditions, their musical traditions, uh, their, their dialects of Gaelic, um, their, their storytelling traditions. Um, so these things, um, as Scotland got sort of more influenced by the English um, and uh, people lost their traditional way of life, um, it continued on in Cape Breton. Um, and the stories continue to be told. There's forms of dance that are uh, practiced in Cape Breton that are no longer practiced in, in, in Scotland. Um, there are dialects of Gaelic that are spoken, that were spoken in Cape Breton that died out in Scotland. Um, and even like, for example, the milling frolic tradition that most people from Cape Breton are familiar with uh, survived in Cape Breton. But it, it's different in Cape Breton as opposed to um, Scotland, whereas in Scotland, it's mainly something that women do. In Cape Breton, men and women and children and you know, the whole community uh, per, uh, participate in the milling frolic.